I know the things I hear are imagined or only want to slow me down. I don't listen, you see? It's easy enough to forget if you try. T plus 18. T plus 19. Welcome to Radical Listening, the Portland podcast where we talk to artists about their work. I'm your host, Phil Johnson. And I'm your co-host, Clifton Holtznagel. And today we talk about Mother Come Home with the author, Paul Horschmeyer, and the director, Jennifer Lynn. Uh, the show is being produced by Third Rail Repertory Theater and it is showing at Coho Theater in Northwest Portland. I gotta say, I had a great time talking to uh, Jen- Jennifer and, and Paul. They are fascinating people and have such a unique perspective on this type of work. Jen coming from the designer world and now, you know, kind of passing through, uh, be, you know, was an actor last year and now she's directing. And Paul, uh, who is not a theater person at all, kind of being brought into the theater world because we're producing his work and experiencing his work through this totally different medium. And I just felt like the conversation was enlightening to see how a visual artist can come into a space like ours and, and, and get so much out of it, but also be able to kind of like see what he did, you know, many years ago in a visual medium and then help us to refine it and then kind of make it a live experience. Yeah. And um, especially last night, we, we had a preview and just hearing the audience react to it and seeing where people laughed and seeing where people cried. Um, I can tell that that impacted him because he's so used to seeing this work or you don't get to watch someone read your graphic novel yeah yeah it, you know it, it, it's very much the graphic novel experience is one that is usually you know it's a private experience a private experience and um i can tell that once we opened it up and made it a community experience it, it changes what you get from the graphic novel and um i just felt like talking to him about the inspiration and what what really drove this piece really brought some insight into uh, what we're producing here at Coho. Yeah, it was really interesting to hear how the form of a graphic novel uh, affected how a a reading or a play can be done and the way the beats affected the the patterns of the speech and the rhythms and all that. So um, I'm very much looking forward to seeing it um, up here in the next couple of weeks. So yeah. And um, it, it w- as a person who was in the show, I mean, I guess I should tell you guys that I'm in the show. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer. Disclaimer. Phil was in the show. So it's me interviewing all of them is really how this one worked. No. I, I <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, we also talk about his company, Forlorn Funnies. We talk about his comic influences. Talk newspaper comics ad nauseum. Yes. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Yeah, if you're a newspaper comic fan, you'll definitely enjoy this episode. Get your fill of the Ziggy. Yep. <laughs> and we talk a little bit about the relationship between um, what we do here in the comic world and um, what Marvel does in, in the cinema. And um, yeah, so I think this is a it's a good episode. It's different than usual, you know? Yeah. So, hope you guys enjoy Paul Hornschmeyer and Jennifer Lynn. Hey, so we are here with Paul Hornschmeyer and Jennifer Lynn on the set of Mother Come Home. And um, just so the audience knows, uh, what are the dates we open and when do we run and all, all that good information? <laughs> uh, we open tonight uh, at 7.30, so today is October 5th. Thank you. And then we run until uh, October 12th, I believe. Um I might have to call in and correct that, but oh, well, it's not the radio, so I don't, I don't know yeah, what I'm, give I'm us a saying. Call. I don't, callers. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> no, no one. Okay, great. So we open tonight, um, and it's been a pretty. It's kind of a whirlwind process for yeah. um, for theater, for sure. Yeah. Um, because I think we only had a. I think I was there. We had a week of rehearsal. And then we kind of had a week of tech. Mm -hmm. But those techs, I mean, usually for theater, you do, uh, you know, a 10 out of 12 or an 8 out of 10. So you're in tech for, you know, two solid days. 
so I mean, I guess hour wise, it kind of all works out. But we did ours in like five hour chunks for four days, and mm. and this is a pretty technically um, heavy yeah. show. Uh, so so it's yeah, it's been a pretty fast process for for theater. So my my main question mm -hmm. is, whose idea was this? Who um, came up with the concept? Who was like, this is what we need to do? Was it was it on your side or was it on your side? Or? Oh no, I mean, I guess it we we accosted. Uh, Paul. Okay. <laughs> it was not third the, rail. He, mm -hmm. he Paul was not just running around looking for small just independent screaming theaters into the darkness. I want to do theater. <laughs> yeah. no. Well, that's how we all get started. That's right. right, right. That's right. Because <laughs> this is a graphic novel, right? Yes, yes, it was. Um, so I was introduced to the graphic novel by my husband in like many years ago, like before before we went into the double digits on, on the millennium side. So like maybe 2008, maybe even 2006. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so a long time ago now. Um, and I really loved the book and it's it was just something that I kind of kept going back to and it never, like every time I opened it, it didn't, it never failed to move me. And, um, and so then when I joined Third Rail uh, Repertory Theater, which is uh, the theater that I'm a company member of, um, we we were actually moving into a new space. And it was kind of right around the time when rents started to really mm -hmm. start spiking. Things were getting more expensive. Um, and Third Rail does this program called NT Live, where they broadcast a motion capture that the National Theatre in London does. And it, I mean, and it does pretty well. And it's, you know, an easy setup. And I don't know, I, I think there's something about the reading this particular graphic novel um, that really made me feel like I wanted to have it be a shared experience with people, mm -hmm. which is not often the experience with with books sure um but it was like there was something about it that felt like so cathartic and and also just somehow you know like it's so powerful that you want this you want to share this experience with someone mm -hmm. um and so that was kind of the seed of the idea so as someone who hasn't seen it um how how do you use the graphic novel um in the play how do you use the images from the graphic novel do you show all of them uh frame by frame or um we we do pretty much show almost sh all of i think yeah. we took out two or three. Oh wow something yeah. like that yeah. yeah yeah and so it it's a lot i mean yeah. when when you're kind of thinking of it as a theory and before you start breaking it down into piece by piece like what's it going to be it sounds like easy you know yeah mm -hmm. like you're just going to Right. <laughs> Hold up the book, re a really giant book, and just like point to it. Um, <laughs> but what it actually means is a lot of, you know, we had to go in and the artwork was, you know, it's all analog artwork. Right. Yeah. The entire, the entire book was done with brush on Bristol board. Oh, and cool. Yeah. So, I mean, all the files existed digitally, but anything. Uh, so, one of the biggest changes from the book to the theater experience is all the text is gone. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in some panels, you know, and I think in the majority of the panels, that was, you know, taking out a word balloon or something like that. But in a decent amount of them, it was, okay, the text is fully integrated over top of the artwork or whatever it is. So it was drawing new artwork or cropping a panel differently or just trying to figure out how to make that, you know, a viable experience for Did people. Did you have to do a lot of that? Uh, um uh, I gotta I gotta give a shout out to James mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> from from Third Rail who he uh, he did a, a vast majority of that which is good because yeah. that meant I had a life while this was yeah. being put together. <laughs> yeah. So uh, no, I probably did. I mean, maybe I did ten percent or something like that of of the actual stuff. So anything that needed to be redrawn, mm -hmm. I was doing all that. But uh, yeah, James. James did yeah. a lot of photoshopping, so yeah, <laughs> and a lot of and uh, but it's it's funny because it's like it did it did really become about process in mm -hmm. this strange way because even taking out the text and then when you start to so we I had taken out all of uh, the text and kind of put it into a script format so we had a version that was just the text alone and James was afterwards uh, went in and took all the text out of the artwork so we had just the artwork alone and then it's kind of trying to together. put them back together um and obviously we can reference the book but you know when you're just just starting to do that like 
because I'm I pretty familiar at with the book at this point so you kind of feel like oh yeah I like I I have a sense of where things are but then you start to really break it down and then it like things you know just become they they become really complicated and even just you know taking out the text and how it forces you to resize the it changes the you know mm. the um dimensions of the panel or you know the sort of spatial relationship between the panels and like all those things really became I mean, sometimes they're used pretty powerfully um, mm -hmm. in, in our production. Like, there's one sequence where, you know, we have panels that are kind of getting bigger um, as they kind of move from left to right across the screen. And that started out because when James took the text out, they had originally all been same size panels or mm -hmm. similar size panels. Mm -hmm. um, and then taking the text out, you know, it kind of forced him to resize them. Mm -hmm. And then he just kind of realized that they kind of make this beautiful flow left to right. Huh. And so it became something that we, we did reuse um, mm -hmm. just from a sort of visual s design standpoint. It, it creates this sort of sense of motion huh. um, without having to animate Right. In, in a traditional sense. That's really interesting because you think about graphic novels or comics and you think about how each frame tells a, tells a specific story, but then when you bring it into a, a situation like this where you, you know, you're showing one um, at a time, then it almost like, it's almost like you kind of have to reapproach, well, maybe this one wants to be square or this one wants to be big or maybe this wants to be full size. hundred percent, yeah. I mean, that was that's a big thing. I mean, we talked about, you know, the panels that we took out, you know, really was because we don't need this here. Like, mm. you know, this was needed on the page for pacing or right. for the emotion of it. But, you know, this this now feels redundant or it's dragging this. Yeah. And we're we're accomplishing what this panel does with the crossfade. Yeah. You know, so time and sort of the experience of reading became so different mm -hmm. uh, mm. once you are introducing, you know, it actually being projected and things coming in in different sequences. Because it is a weird thing when you're designing a page of comics that, you know, the engine of comics is is reading. It's not like looking at a painting. Yeah. But at the same time, you're always conscious of the fact that unlike a page of text where, you know, everything's abstract and you're not worried about somebody processing, uh, you know, paragraph seven before they read paragraph one. Mm -hmm. With a page of comics, you kind of do simultaneously see information that you're reading. Yeah. So time and processing of a narrative becomes very strange. Yeah. And here we have a little more direct control over how people are ingesting things and how pacing is, but it definitely changed. Mm -hmm you know, how we had to put it together because, you know, there were some things that worked sort of straight out of the can and then other things that, as I'm sure Jen would attest, <laughs> we had to, you know, work on quite a bit yeah. as far as the pacing. <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah. take that 15 seconds again. Yes. Everybody stand by. <laughs> yeah. We're going to reset. What's that cue that kept, we kept firing in the background over and over again? Um, oh, it's there's a, a sound cue that... It's a present. There you go. <laughs> That's <laughs> nice. <Yeah. laughs> Um, that's hi, Rory. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah shout out. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, but that's another thing, like, you know, layering the sound design on top of that and then mm -hmm. having the actors yeah. in the room and, and just the difference between, you know, having the actors in the room and then as they kind of, as you guys become familiar with it, fills in the show. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> or, or disclaimer. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. <laughs> but like th these things that you just think of something that we kind of have to work around or find some way to mask, which is the, you know, when we show a row of the comic on the, the screen, we've got to, you know, we've got to take those images out and then bring up the next images in a way that feels graceful and mm -hmm. is with it kind of that goes with the pacing that you guys are setting. Um, I mean, it's like trying to edit a, a movie together so that it can be played mm -hmm. in real time with live actors, um, right. and it, and it's really hard. <laughs> yeah. um, but what it, what I you know really you know blew my mind last night at our uh, preview performance was just the way in which it is a lot like listening to a group of musicians play because mm. the way that everything starts to work together as people get 
familiar with the rhythms and the the images that they're kind of playing off of. Um, it, it was really beautiful and amazing and powerful. And you should really, I, I recommend the show. Um. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool because, you know, a lot of times with theater, you know, the speaking and the text finds its own rhythm throughout, but it can change mm -hmm. or whatever. But having that limitation of, you know, what's happening on screen and you have to get the rhythm and the flow, I think it actually could lead to a very, very beautiful thing. It, I mean, it does make you realize, like, you know, so much about what visual art is about, you know, like that a blank screen is still a visual statement. Yeah. And it's in performance, it's, it is also a moment in time. A breath is, can be an expressive thing. A right. silence is an expressive thing. And, um, you know, all the, like, I feel like I'm going to start doing a pretentious jazz drumming documentary. <laughs> but, like, but it's, like, the space between the notes and, like, right. all those things together um, mm -hmm. really make the, the art. Well, I mean, I was going to say that's, you know, the, the space between is really, you know, anytime I'm being pretentious and teaching college classes on on comics, you know, I always try to emphasize that, you know, comics... You know, I talked about the engine of it being reading, but really the authorship in comics is the what's called the gutter. You know, and I always joke about put your mind in the gutter, but it's mm. you know that's what where you do all the work in comics is mm. in between the two panels because mm. you know one is a drawing and another's a drawing, mm -hmm. but you know what's happening in the juxtaposition of those two things is where the reader you know because it's i see a guy you know looks like he's walking and then suddenly he's falling out of an airplane or he's yeah. whatever okay well, what happened in between mm -hmm. those two or now he's a child again or whatever you know and you can do anything in between those two and the person is writing a story in their own head in very much in a way that doesn't happen with prose yeah, and here it's yeah it's it's very interesting how we've played with that because you know again we're controlling how those things are coming on screen or how big they are in ways that mm -hmm. you can't necessarily do unless you were doing a comic you know this size <laughs> um, which I haven't done too many uh, what is this thirty feet comics or anything yeah. like that. <laughs> but um, but there's something I mean I was just gonna say that you know just as one very small example there's a part in the play where you know, uh, somebody's turning off a light and there's a click that mm -hmm. happens and the whole screen goes white and then it moves to this kind of montage and that's such a completely different experience from the comic. And it's not a, like a massive moment or anything like that, but that moment really struck me. And there's a few times in the production that are just, I'm like, th th that was what was so exciting to me about doing the play because it was so different from what was possible in the book. I w I'm interested in your experience of this production, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as a person who wrote this and, and wrote this a while ago. And so now you're kind of Long coming back yeah. to it and it's seeing been, it live. <laughs> it's been very strange. Yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, I'm trying to think. I was I was nine years old when I wrote this book. No, uh, <laughs> but I did. I mean, this book was about 15 years ago. And it's been very strange to come back. To, I mean, it's definitely the book, you know, I've done whatever seven books at this point but this is the book that you know definitely has the most effect on people I would certainly say it's the most emotional book that I've written um but you know I like revisiting it through this experience I mean first off I have to say the first runs through it when I got here you know about a week ago I didn't remember parts <laughs> of the book you know I mean because yeah. it's it's just funny because I remember, I mean, you know, you write something, you remember, you know, plot points and characters and all that, but, you know, just little pieces of dialogue or little nuances and just also seeing what actors were doing with it and totally bringing, I mean, it's funny because, you know, you, Phil played the doctor. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what the doctor's voice sounded like exactly. And like, once you did, I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's right. That's, <laughs> that sounds right to me. Um, so it's been it's been very interesting. I mean, when, uh, you know, Jen uh, approached me about this, um, Jen and another person named Jen, two yeah. Jens. Jen Rupp. Uh, yeah. Um, shout out to Jen. Um, you know, they, uh, I had been, you know, I was in a drama club in high school and was very interested in plays and my mom would always take us to plays, but uh, I had been more, you know, moving in a film and TV direction and really hadn't thought about theater 
And I think, you know, the two of you, you know, kind of pitched me the idea and I was just like, oh, wow, that sounds really cool. I have no idea how that yeah. would work. And it is kind of like this odd alchemy because it was mm -hmm. this thing that, you know, that had affected me um, and I just wouldn't shut up about it. And but I don't think, you know, particularly at that moment in my life, like I'm, you know, for the idea of like contacting an author and like you know <laughs> like approaching someone with an idea just seemed like crazy to me and mm -hmm. so it was really Jen Rowe who was just like well let's just see um and you know and then it kind of, like it it's this strange you know I'm always kind of blown away by the sort of casual generosity of artists yeah and how people are just so casually generous about like helping you you know find your idea helping and you know can be so you know casually generous about like helping you find your voice you know helping like if they if someone you know thinks that your idea seems like a good idea like you know uh kind of just helping you get something moving mm -hmm. uh is always amazing to me so yeah, artists There's are the best advocates for art, <laughs> you know. Well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's you know, it's just, that's just it. Is like when somebody tells me about something cool, no matter what it is, I'm always like, yeah, great, you know, this is awesome. Yeah. How can we make this happen? To, to probably a point that's, I mean, I because that's just it. Like if <laughs> yeah. you had said, we have this idea, it has nothing to do with your work. I probably would have had around the same or more enthusiasm <laughs> because <laughs> I just, yeah, that's just it. Like you're just excited to see great stuff get made. So, yeah. yeah. So how did, you know, where did this story come from? Did you, um, is it an, is it autobiographical or? No, no, it is not. Um, both my, you know, my parents are, uh, not, not the, uh, parents in this story. Um, uh, it came from a lot of different places at, the time in my life that I was writing it. Um, some of it, some of it is directly based on my relationship with my father. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of it is based on his relationship with his father. Um, but, uh, you know, and there's, there are scenes in the book that are directly lifted from things that I experienced or that he experienced, but sort of the, I would say tone of the relationship with the uh, the son and the father is is very much kind of how I grew up with my dad. Um, he uh, you know he's a very logical guy, but at the same time could be very very warm, uh, but also kind of wasn't as much of a presence in our life as our mother. Um, but I mean, it really, it came out of. You know, I was kind of in my approaching my mid twenties at the time, and uh, you know, realizing that my parents were getting older, and looking at them and realizing, like, oh wait, so one of them, you know, statistically, one of them <laughs> is going to die before the other. Uh, although statistically, <laughs> very <would> logical. <laughs> statistically, it would be my father uh, before my mother. No offense, Dad. Um, but, you know, thinking about, I actually was in a, a long relationship at that point and actually had been engaged and very, very wisely, the woman had run as far away from me as possible. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> at that point in my life, I wouldn't have wanted to be around me either. Um, but, you know, kind of thinking about being in a situation where it's your best friend and you've lost this person and mm -hmm. depending on how much you had built up around that relationship and that friendship and that partnership what that can mean uh so it was sort of that was one part of it but another was um i was a philosophy major mm -hmm. at the time and, and got my degree in philosophy but my uh my symbolic logic professor, who has the same last name as uh, um, somebody, actually recently sent me some questions outing me for is this based off of oh. the the professor? And I was just like, uh, yes. <laughs> 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 so uh, it, we were in class at one point, and you know, again, he's a logic professor, but he had recently been on uh, safari with his wife, and she had taken this anti-malaria vaccination, and. Uh, was basically on death's door because of oh, the vaccination wow. and he and it was a you know it was a small moment it's not like he had some major breakdown but he got really upset and started ranting in the middle of class which was totally uncharacteristic for him and 
you know, very understandably why he was, why he was so upset. Uh, but he was talking about apparently the CDC had never tested this on women, which I have come to find Uh, out is a huge problem in medical testing. I did not know this. John Oliver has a very good piece on that. If you ever want to look it up. Um, but, uh, yeah, but you know, was watching this person whose world was very much logic and you know systems of explanation and you know being able to break things down, and even the way he was approaching that you know kind of breakdown moment of being super upset about it was couched in like the CDC didn't approach their you know testing correctly and all these things. But what he was, you know, what he was really saying is my wife might die, and I don't know what to do about this, and I can't control it, and my world is about to fall apart, mm. but let me go on teaching this class, <laughs> you know, yeah, and it wow. was just, it was, and it was I, like moments like that, you know, I, I definitely, I don't know. I'm think I'm too sensitive to certain things. I think all artists are, but you know, I it was kind of like, I just felt like it was a very slow motion kind of moment where I was kind of looking around the class. Like, is everybody else seeing this? Like, <laughs> Jesus, like, do, are we recognizing what's happening in this moment? And it, it just left a really huge impression on me. And yeah, so it was, yeah, just a lot of things kind of going on in my life at the same time when I started writing. But I, you know, I had, when I write, particularly at that time, I was very terrible about writing. I would just write on sc- little tiny scraps of paper and like everything would kind of be spread all over the place. There's a scene where the house is sort of mm-hmm. falling into disarray. That's very much what my life was <laughs> like at that point. Um, but I didn't really know. I, I had, you know, visions of, oh, there's this kid in this mask and, and you know, something about, you know, one of the parents dying. and But I didn't really, there wasn't anything. I th- and I think I took those sort of key things in my life to kind of start pulling the story together. So you were in college at Ohio State University. At, o- at the, the, o- Ohio the Ohio State. State. We don't get sued. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think. I was just, I well, I, yeah, so I probably started writing the story so i mean almost any story that i write takes years um but i think i started writing it probably just post college or something like that that would have been about right so you were a philosophy major what made you decide to start drawing well i mean i had always i mean it's funny i remember my guidance counselor in high school being like let me get this straight you're the art guy and you're gonna go into philosophy Mm. (laughs) and i mean my response as a you know whatever shithead 18 year old uh it was like well i already know how to draw yeah, <laughs> yeah fair and enough and he didn't punch me which he should have um yeah i don't know it was one of those things i just uh it was weird because i had drawn comics you know when i mean i started drawing comics when i was four you know mm-hmm. which is very surreal to you know be watching my boys starting i have two two boys <laughs> and they're starting to draw comics so like oh, my, my seven-year-old is obsessed with drawing comics at this point um but yeah, I, you know, I started with, you know, just kind of whatever and that evolved into, okay, I'm going to do superhero comics. And this was kind of around the time that Image Comics was coming into existence. And it was all these, you know, the top tier guys leaving Marvel and DC. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of right when I was starting to learn more about comics anyway, but I was kind of looking into, well, why are these guys leaving these companies? And then I started to realize like, oh, that's because creators don't have any rights at all. And that was, you know, sort of simultaneously, my stuff was going from superheroes to like kind of science fiction. Cause I was like, wait, why does this guy wear this weird costume? And like, he wouldn't, nobody would dress like that. Uh, maybe he just wears a jacket and like moving more and more to science fiction and then to just fiction and then just to sad people in their bedrooms. <laughs> and, and like very quickly I got to a point, you know, that was over the course of like a year or two that I got to a point where I'm like, there's nowhere for this to live. Like, yeah. I don't know because this was, you know, this was back in my day, you know, it was like pre-internet Southern yeah. Ohio. So I didn't know anything about, you know, independent comics or just frankly anything. Well, you know, Ohio has a very long, you know, like full history of comic writers. Oh, 100%, yeah. but I didn't know any of that. Oh, you know, yeah, I didn't yeah. know Milk Kniff or any of these, you know, you know, amazing, amazing cartoonists that came out of Ohio. Superman started uh, in exactly. Cleveland. Exactly. Right? I mean, yeah. none of that. None of that was on my radar. So right. uh, it was, th- but it was kind of, you know, I had found like one, I remember there was somebody, uh, shout out to Superior 7, I think was the name of the comic that was like a self-published comic that some people had done out of Cincinnati 
Um, I remember my mom would drive me into Cincinnati, which was like an hour away from where I grew up. I mean, where I yeah. grew up, there were like 2,000 people in the town. and It was, you know, cows and waterfalls. Oh, wow. and Oh, yeah. I mean, it was tiny. Um, but, yeah, it really wasn't until I got to college. And then, you know, I was in my second year of college and somebody... Uh, the, the girl that I was later engaged to uh, gave me uh, a copy of Ghost World wow. and uh, by Dan Klaus. And when I read that, I mean, that was just, you know, mm-hmm. huge light bulb above my head in a cartoonish fashion um, where I was like, oh, wait, this is more like the stuff that I was doing when I quit doing comics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. So that kind of it was still like another year before I really started doing comics again. Mm-hmm. But that got me looking into, you know, Fanagraphics and all these other publishers drawn in quarterly and, you know, other cartoonists and really realizing what all was out there and realizing, oh, wait, I guess there is a home for these weird stories that, you know. Yeah. Are, yeah. What's what's your relationship with newspaper comics? How do you feel about newspaper comics? I'm oh, well, I have I have an intense relationship with newspaper Me comics. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, my first published stuff was in a newspaper. Uh, I have to you know give another shout out to my little sister Mary. Um, she was she was picked to be the editor on like I don't know of like this kids section that was in our local paper, mm-hmm. and. I'm sure that it was just me, you know, being a, a bullyish, uh, you know, older brother. But I was like, hey, I can put something in there. And she was like, OK, you know. <laughs> and so I every week or whatever it was, I think it was every week I would put like different stuff in there. And it was basically just I would like do characters and like write their stories. Yeah. And, you know, whatever. Um, but, yeah, it's funny. I mean, I so the f- next thing that I had published was in the Ohio State's um, the Ohio State's newspaper, The Lantern, um, where Jeff Smith, who did Bone, yeah, started. Totally. So that's where Bone started, right? As far as I know, yeah, um, that's what I had read too. Yeah, and so that was actually kind of great because, and I did a horrible, horrible comic that no one should ever look up um, <laughs> called Squares because uh, it was name, Squares. Uh, <laughs> no, it's fine. It was. It's. I think at least one strip of it is in. Uh, I did a collection of the stuff that I published in college, which I think I don't think I put anything more than one strip in there because it's <laughs> god awful. Um, but, you know, that was something where it was like every day, you know, 60,000 people would see a strip and it was it was definitely a, a cool experience. But I mean, as far as like the stuff that's in newspapers in general, I mean, yeah, it's got awful. You know, just, yeah. I mean, Peanuts is obviously one of the greatest things that's <laughs> ever been created yeah. in the history of any art form. Right. And then like. Garfield was cool, like back in the eighties. <laughs> right, <Yeah. laughs> they've been on for so long. Yeah. I was just, um, I went to a, a restaurant, uh, one of the McMinimins joints, and above the urinals in the men's bathroom, they'll like post the comics section. Uh-huh. And I used to read the comics every day in the paper when I was a kid. And I would like come home from like vacation and be like, I have like two weeks of comics worth to read. I'm so excited, mm-hmm. and I used to love them. And then I like yeah. looked at this page. And I was like, these are all the same comics that I was reading, you know, fifteen, yeah. twenty years ago. Yeah. Um, and so I did some deep diving. My sister was a big Mary Worth fan oh, for yeah. some reason. Yeah. She had cut them all out and like had them like all over her wall mm-hmm. for like a good while. Mary Worth has been on like in the papers for like eighty years. Well, and it's which funny, is crazy. If you look at the heyday <laughs> of most of those strips. It's like there's some gorgeous artwork from. I mean, mm-hmm. the, I was spoiled. Uh, you know, at, at Ohio State, there's uh, you know a cartoon art library, which now is oh, infinitely cool. better. Than, yeah. uh, than when I was there. But they have all these amazing originals from, you know, Chester Gould and, you know, things like Apartment 3G and Mary mm-hmm. Worth and all these things. And, you know, tons of Milk Kniff basically donated wow. all his art. Um, they have tons of, you know, Bill Watterson. I mean, just, yeah. you know, just amazing stuff. Yeah, so Hobbs that's fan. so that's the thing. I mean, you look at, you know, Calvin and Hobbes and, you know, the far side was a huge influence oh, on yeah, me yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. Um, there's amazing stuff in newspapers. But right. Yeah, then there's a lot of stuff. I mean, I, honestly, I feel like the last good strip that I saw started was probably like Mutts or something. And mm-hmm. that was, I mean, Jesus, I don't know. Was that almost like 15, 20 years ago? I know. Ago I, mean, or I remember the, the things that now. I remembered as new, like Get Fuzzy or stuff like that, right. is like not yeah, it's new old now. No, anymore. No, no. <laughs> yeah, but it's, and it's just one of those things. I mean, it's just a very changing landscape and i just think it's been because i mean it used to be you know i mean back in the day back way back in the day in the early 1900s i mean 
that was it, you know. I mean, right. Windsor McKay and artists like that were basically the rock stars of their time because, you know, and they did these, I don't know if you've seen any of those little Nemo pages or anything like mm-hmm. that, but they're these huge broadsheet, full color, like just, oh, wow. I mean, they're just some of the greatest works of art ever created, but which, by the way, I just tried horribly to recreate his style for a, a special edition that Marvel was putting out where I was doing the Inhumans and Windsor McKay's style that was if you draw in his style for even one page you realize like oh wait a i'm nowhere near good enough to do this and be like jesus this guy was just like an amazing amazing craftsman but you know i mean the size has just dwindled and dwindled i mean peanuts when it was started was a a space saver comic quote unquote because all the panels were exactly square and could be rearranged vertically or horizontally or in a in a block um and you know that's only continued so it's just one of those things like i just feel like most of the people who are amazed like i don't know if you've seen kate beaton's uh hark a vagrant strip no No. i mean it's you know easily one of the best comic strips that's ever i mean she's the funniest person on the planet and one of the most naturally gifted cartoonists i've ever seen but you know and that's something that would have just destroyed like the comics page it would have been awesome but you know she wasn't doing that she was doing it on a blog you know right and and she found it on and it's that way and you know you know thousands or hundreds of thousands of people read it and it was great for her but that's the kind of person that probably you know would have been courted by like a syndicate or something like that back in the day but it's just such a different thing they already have all their comics (laughs) yeah yeah that's just it we're still we're running (laughs) merry work yeah yeah Yeah. That's interesting. And nowadays with the self-publishing uh-huh. world that we live in, uh, I have the app uh, Webtoon. Mm-hmm. I use that a lot. Right. And um, it's great. I mean, now you, there's there's so there's so much variety in comics nowadays. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, that was, you know, the, the syndication and things like that. I mean, that was the only game in town yeah. back in the day. And it's just not anymore. So, yeah. Right. Now, would you ever do this again? Would you ever adapt another comic to this uh style <laughs> you're asking jen in the middle of, of trauma <laughs> <laughs> no i mean I, I actually yes uh absolutely we mm-hmm. do this again um i mean and even i mean it, because it's been so interesting like it is such this melding of like different art forms and this um you know when paul was talking about the way that you set up a comic and the awareness that you have that like the eye is going to take in is going to read the text and that drives it. But at the same time you are taking in the full page on mm-hmm. some level. Um, that applies here as well, because we have the, we have live human beings on the stage and they are, you know, performing and, you know, like there's a connection to the words that they're speaking. And, and yet, you know, on a huge scale, we have this artwork um, so it's the, it is also this very interesting thing about like your focus is on the artwork, but at the same time you're taking in so many other things. There's someone sitting next to you who might be, you know, having an emotional experience. Um, and so like even like it's it's been so fascinating that I can't imagine not trying it yeah. again and like where things t- like you know just minute adjustments. Yeah. You know, I I mean. It's I, most of the time I'm a lighting designer, and so it it does feel like you know when you kind of are involved in like something that's technical, you you start to feel like I could do this. Yeah, I could do this one cue forever, a million different ways, and it would be a it would be slightly different every time. And you know, life's just not long enough, and also you <laughs> should move on. Yeah. <laughs> um, but at the but but it's it's this really wonderful gift to kind of sit with something that is really specific and yet has so many like complicating th- complicated things that it's kind of synthesizing in inside of your brain mm-hmm. uh, when you experience. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I we're, I definitely I definitely want to do it ag- again. And this uh, project is actually um, we've been awarded the Creative Heights grant from the Oregon Cultural Trust. I hope hopefully I'm getting the organization's name right. So yeah. Now, so we'll be what's trying it this like again. kind of putting on a different hat and becoming a director when you come from Oh my god. Yeah. It's it's the worst. Like 
<laughs> I mean, I mean, like it, it's not the worst in terms of like I've been so so lucky. Like, but at the same time, there is because there's so many directors in town that I'm that I have so much respect for, and you know, I want you know, you want to sort of hit their bar, and then, but part of it is like you kind of get the best people um and they're so good that you just sit there thinking like what the hell am i doing here uh, you know, <laughs> what because, do i have to say? yeah yeah <laughs> um it, like directing is a a weird interesting job yeah um because it i mean it's great it, it's terrifying just because you know like you're um it i mean it's always hard to wear a different hat yeah, um yeah. Or to find yourself in a situation where, like, you're you you gotta try something new, you know, in real time with people that you admire and respect, um, and sort of, you know, and sort of rise rise to everyone's level. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's been great. That's good. Yeah. And you've and, and you've also acted recently too, so you're actually kind of breaking out of the design world and you're moving to all of the different it's weird it, like i think i was talking to paul about like it all feels really accidental mm -hmm. um but i mean i do think that it, it is about like the the generosity of of artists and also just that i mean i think um i'm gonna advocate for generosity um you know like there's there That's is your some, mission yeah, yeah. There, there's there something we go. Right. <laughs> let me take that back um, <laughs> but i there is something just about when when you're around people who kind of you know inspire you to kind of you know have opinions and like voice your opinions and talk about what you think like it kind of just feeds on itself like you have more ideas when yeah. you're allowed to kind of give voice to your ideas yeah um and you just find that you have more um so like there's no it feels like there's kind of no downside to sort of like opening things up yeah definitely i've been m mostly acting for a long time and recently i've done a lot more of video and sound and things like that and i'm in a play right now that's being directed by someone who is also usually a lighting designer mm -hmm. so it's really cool because a lot of times directors are coming from an actor's perspective mm -hmm. but it's really great when you have someone who's coming from a technical perspective because yeah. I don't know. He also is very good with actors too, but like um, th the the vision becomes so much bigger. Like we maxed out the electrics in the building we're mm -hmm. in just because he had these huge ideas, and so it is really cool when you get to see something like that. And for a show like this too, um, that is tech heavy, having someone with a lot of technical knowledge is very helpful. I would I would think yeah. so. Yeah, it's I'm, really cool. I mean, I have some I. I have enough technical knowledge to know that I don't have enough technical <laughs> knowledge. So well, I mean, I, I do yeah. have to like, I have to. Well, like, but I think that's the mark of a good director. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, I've heard that from various directors, you know, quotes or whatever, where they're like, you know, the job of a director is to get, you know, everybody in the departments that's better at the thing yeah. than you could ever be. <laughs> right. And then to some degree to like, you were kind of saying like, stand back and let them be amazing and, you know, but then to help empower them to be amazing at what they do, which I yeah. think you've done such an amazing job at that of just, you know, pushing people where they need pushed and, you know, doing all those things. But yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's awesome to, I, I, it's very strange to me. I remember asking a friend of mine who's, he's a sound coordinator for, you know, things like, you know, he was worked on Transformers and like all these huge films. And I remember asking him like, so when did, when did the directors like sit down with all the department heads and like, talk with you about what you need to be supported and empowered and he was like you just started laughing he's like that shit doesn't happen and i was <laughs> like oh okay <laughs> you know and like you've been so inclusive and everybody's been so part of the process that like it just elevates everybody's game so yeah yeah just that's just me giving you compliments i don't know <laughs> paul. <laughs> paul could i ask you about forlorn tv because i watched a bunch of that last oh, night oh sure yes uh do you um are you low on butter <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, I really like the, the the muddle mob. Muddle I want to see more muddle mob. Yeah, muddle mob, which is uh, <laughs> all me. Um, yeah, do all the voices. Um, oh, cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was kind of just an experiment. Uh, I don't even remember when it came about or what the thought was, but um, I'd been doing a little bit more with animation. It was funny because I was telling Jen about this. The 
composer who did music for Mother Come Home had been like, you know, when you start doing animation, I want to do music for your stuff. And I was like, oh, what? <laughs> I never do animation. That's yeah. like having to draw everything in between the panels. And, kind of. <laughs> um, and since then, I've worked on tons of animation. But yeah, I don't know. I was just getting very excited about, you know, the possibilities of you know, minimal animation and really watching yeah. things like Rocky and Bullwinkle sure. and a lot of these, you know, things that came out of sort of like 60s and 70s, very, you know, like filmation and the stuff that they were doing with like, have you ever seen Star Trek, the animated series? No. Uh, Star Check Trek. Star Trek, the animated series with all the, all the original cast is doing the voices. Wow. What? And it is so fucked up because you realize how overacty that show is like the whole William Shatner overacting kind yeah. of thing but like to see it with minimal animation gives it this total <laughs> surreal element to it yeah so I was I was very interested in like well I don't know you know this works and thinking about like what you could do with you know just really minimal rigs and after effects right, and yeah. things mm -hmm. so I mean yeah really it was just it just started as an experiment. I mean, the very first one is just one shot. You know, it's right, just one, yeah. literally one drawing with a flapping mouth. Right. And I did that one, uh, you know, and it was just me improvising a monologue and then just, you know, pitch shifting it and <laughs> cool. affecting it a little bit. And that's Mark's, Mark's music, I think, is in every single one of them. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was kind of then thinking like, well, okay, what if I do, you know, sort of a, a three-quarter profile shot and then a close-up or something mm -hmm. and you know, see what I can do to kind of just create a whole story right. with just a couple shots. Muddle Mob is like one of the only ones where there's like actually, yeah, yeah, like, you know, <laughs> different coverage, so to speak. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, and it's funny because there's a couple that, I think I did like 12 of them or something. Mm -hmm. um, toward the end, I started to figure out different ways to do the mouths and things where it was still, I think another thing that was, I don't remember, I think I figured this out or heard this before I got into it is that if you watch the original Simpsons that they weren't even doing traditional lip sync like that it's actually just moving mouths in a pattern oh, yeah. so it's like you know the voice starts and the pattern starts and then the voice stops and the pattern stops it's just the same pattern but it's all the not time. yeah but it's <laughs> yeah. not it's just it's the Mr. Ed put some peanut butter in the horse's mouth and make him move his mouth right, right. Not, not actual lip sync <laughs> South Park did that too in the yeah, yeah 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 so I mean it was I was looking at things like that and being like well that works and it's fine right. and realizing again like looking at you know I think Rocky and Bullwinkle is one of the funniest shows and realizing like it's literally just their mouths are opening and closing it's not even mm. it's not lip sync in the way yeah. that we think of lip sync yeah so it was just i mean again you know similar to the the play or to anything it's just kind of looking at like how does a story work and like what do you need to make a story work and like when do you you know when do you get bored with something or stop paying attention to it or when does it when does it carry Sure. And uh, yeah, that first one, I to be honest with you, I was just like, oh, this will be interesting and I'm sure it won't work <laughs> um, because I was like, you know, it's like a four minute story and it's just one drawing. And I'm like, yeah. ah, that won't work. But like, yeah, with the music and you just you do kind of pay attention to it. And right. Yeah. So yeah. that was it was just I mean, the whole thing was just an experiment. To yeah, see. it was. Re it's a really cool outlet for just some cool ideas and i really did like the simplistic animation mm -hmm. because it was like you're kind of focusing on the sound of the voice and what they're saying yeah and it added a lot it. to the character like especially with, like the cowboy character mm -hmm. in that one he's i mean it makes sense that he's just kind of sitting there jawing on and it's mm -hmm. got this weird story that just goes and, yeah i don't yeah, know I, I was enjoying it yeah, yeah that's literally just a, a story about a, a girlfriend of mine giving me a shirt so yeah yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> gave me the shirt <laughs> you know she worked at fashion bug i think it was so yeah there you go nice. yeah ah uh, fashion bug <laughs> <laughs> yep great let's take a break you can find radical listening from virtual sonic reality on apple podcasts google play and spotify so find us on your favorite podcast app and hit subscribe to follow along while you're there why don't you just go ahead and give us five stars you know you love us and we love you too so, thanks for listening, and enjoy the show. And we're back. Time to do headlines. 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 Their favorite part. Do favorite part of the show. Do you have, like, a jazzy theme music that comes in for headlines? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but this well, is episode what? six. For so. you, okay. we will. <laughs> All right. Headlines. <laughs> yeah, give, yeah, that was it. Give us that a little bit more. One more. Headlines. Here come <laughs> those headlines. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Boom. Headlines. <laughs> See? What a great! That a was pro. great. Wait, I mean, great. Wow. What that was going to be on every episode. <laughs> 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 We're hard up for content. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Paul Hornschmeyer sings the hits that never were. <laughs> That's right. Hey, you put put a, a dancey track behind that. It's going to be great. You're into old comics. You must be into jingles, too. That's right. By the way, feel free to cut down all that syndicated newspaper comic stuff. stuff that oh, no, that's, that's okay. the meat of this <laughs> That's podcast. right. That's right. That's what everybody Sorry came to this for. Sorry I got us into that. Yeah. I, I was such a, oh. You're like, so man, have you heard Paul kid. riff on Ziggy? <laughs> <laughs> Ziggy, holy oh, shit. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ooh, that guy with the round head. Yep. Mm. Okay, so... Martin Scorsese. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. He compares Marvel movies to theme parks, and he says they're mm-hmm. not cinema. So, uh, is yep. he correct in Hot that, take. or what do you think? Yeah, I, I saw I saw that I saw the headline. I looked it up, and then I but then I saw you know Martin Scorsese said this, but is he correct? And I'm like, uh, he that is outside the realm of being correct because it's an opinion. <laughs> right. Oh. So. People can have tastes. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I gotta be that's honest. My hot take. I watched uh, Captain Marvel the other day. <laughs> Captain mm-hmm. Marvel. <laughs> and um, I mean, it took me a while to like get the style choice, mm-hmm. and I was like, "This movie is awful." And I really wanted to like it because I love Brie mm-hmm. Larson. But yeah, I, it's. I mean, I thought I agreed. I thought there was a lot of great performances, and but it didn't really super work as a movie. Um, I mean, and that's the thing is like, you know, his statement. I was like, and you know, I went and looked up his original statement, and I was like, this is completely innocuous and basically inarguable that most superhero movies and most, but it's not just superhero movies, like big yeah. studio movies. It's like, yeah, they're there to you know put butts in seat and seats and make billions of dollars, and yeah. they're not. He's talking about art with a capital A, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, yeah, I don't. Who would argue, yeah. you know, that they are much more than theme parks? Because that's, that's you the know. whole point. Getting yeah. people there. To and I think there's there's standouts experience. like you know I thought Logan was like oh, yeah, you know it's Logan like oh that's cool. like a good spaghetti western mm-hmm. kind of thing. And you know there's there are a few, you know there's a few superhero movies that I think work really well. Like I thought the first Iron Man was like, you know, I'm like, that was like a genuinely fun, you know, kind of science fiction, you know, film that happens to be a superhero movie. Like that's fine. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy, I felt like was kind of the same thing, but Mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, it's only a handful, you know, I think when they really started going down the, uh, the Avengers rabbit hole, that's when things started to get a little, because at this point it's just like quick cut, quick cut, quick cut, action scene mm-hmm. that one line and then end of the movie and we're just you know and then they're like right. or cliffhanger right right and then you're just like okay so what did i just watch for three hours it totally i mean the yeah. the sort of taking that to its logical end for me is transformers you know mm-hmm. like transformers <laughs> is just and, and don't get me wrong i'll watch any of these i love big loud explodey stuff you know i'll like watch some you know 1970s art house film and then like all right now let's watch robots beat the shit out of each other mm-hmm. um but like you can watch two hours of that and it's just like nothing happened you didn't even know what you were looking at half <laughs> right. the time yeah. it was just like hot metal exploding yeah and <laughs> like all right so it's like yeah, he's not wrong yeah, but you know right. it's like but all these people were, yeah, freaking out on Twitter, like, no. oh, yeah. <laughs> good for him, or how <laughs> dare he? I'm like, it's it's a man with an opinion. It's okay. Right. Well, it's Martin Scorsese, so yeah. Which is the other thing. I'm like, he's. I think he's earned the right to <laughs> say what he wants about cinema. I, think that's <laughs> okay. yeah. I had. I have to confess, I had, don't think I've seen like any. Most of these movies I have not seen, mm-hmm. you know? and fair. I and I think that it's and that's okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but at the same time, I feel like I've seen them because the thing that you're talking about, like where you're just right. watching a lot of explosions and mm-hmm. like I don't know, maybe someone does a zippy one liner, right? You know, I, I mean, I, I think that like no. there's a myth about like what we what people crave in terms of like what they want to give their attention to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like those types of movies? kind of um pull audiences away from wanting to get deeper fuller art you know like higher concept art yeah i mean i don't know I, you know what do you think i mm, i think that i i'm not sure what i think i i don't think they pull people away but they distract people from the f- uh from the realization that they're not 
maybe. Mm, yeah. You know, I mean, it's sort of like a junk food thing where yeah. you yeah, can eat it and you can feel full, or at least your day has gone and you don't mm. know what to do with it. Um, right. But like, I yeah, I mean, I don't think that people are pulling, but it's definitely taking up like resources mm -hmm. that's the biggest thing is i mean I, I think the thing is discouraging you know me working more in tv and film is like looking at you know you look at a film and it's 300 million dollars or something like that and i mean i think the new avengers were even more than that and it's like and a fourth in some series yeah <laughs> like, like and you're still you look at something this. like that and you realize i mean you know i'm as far as independent things I have in development and stuff like that, I mean, you're you're talking about budgets that are a million dollars, or I mean, you look at something like you know, Get Out, or I mean, any of that Blumhouse model, mm -hmm. you know, it's like Get Out was made for like four and a half or four point nine million, yeah. and you're like, how many Get Outs could be made for? I mean, you know, that yeah, was that was a true. standout film, and Jordan right. Peele, I think, is a genius, but you know what I'm saying is like, as far as independent voices or productions. Okay, that's you know you're doing the math in your head like that's a lot of movies that could get out there in the world yeah. if you didn't have that three hundred. And the weird thing is, you look at how much money they spend on it, and then it's like yeah, and then it made two billion dollars, and you're like, but you spent three hundred million on it, and then the marketing was like, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Steven Soderbergh has a like a, a speech that he gave that frankly I can't believe he wasn't killed right after he gave it because it's way too honest and informative <laughs> but he talks about sort of the budget breakdown mm -hmm. and like you know think about the budget for a film he's it's basically a talk about why are there 150 million dollar films versus a whole bunch of like yeah. you know 15 million dollar films and it's really eye-opening but he talks about you know sort of like any film you have then you've got the marketing is usually about whatever the budget was oh they don't count that they don't count the marketing no. of the budget when they and talk then, about it wow. no no so i mean like something that's like 300 million you've got another several hundred million in marketing oh. and then you've got the cost of it opening overseas which anything like that's going to be in every market but you think about it and you look at it and they only get 50 percent of the box office right <laughs> it's like this is something that particularly as i've been in development over the last you know much more so over the last five years looking at like the numbers side of things mm -hmm. and it's just it's staggering yeah mm -hmm. and you're just like that doesn't that can't be the best way for <laughs> <laughs> to put you know because then it's like it has to be effectively a theme park you know yeah. for them to make enough to make it worth it and then quite literally they really have to make a theme park and then they have to make a theme park <laughs> based on the theme park i mean well and that's just it you look at any of these studios and they you know everything's integrated and it's yeah. all owned by i mean effectively disney at this point right um <laughs> since they own 90 percent of the world's properties um yeah but that's just it and then it's you know the breakfast cereal and the theme park and all that kind of stuff so um i want to continue in the same vein um <laughs> rachel maddow joins the cast of the cw's batwoman w what okay wow. <laughs> so rachel who, maddow who is, is now she oh she is the um i mean no i know who i know who rachel maddow is but like yeah, who, who is she, she play? be in the bat or she just play herself Right. <laughs> One mi moment. <laughs> Let's see. Because this, this broke, I think, yesterday, and she confirmed it on Twitter. Okay. Wow. <laughs> How does she have time to do that would be my biggest question. Oh, she's she's playing the villain. Okay. What? Yes. So that's that's not that's not I mean, doesn't a small commitment because her show she's is like a daily thing, right? Yeah, and yeah. she doesn't she have books and various things? Yeah, she just I mean, released a book. I don't understand She's how people like that uh, really sleep or yeah, yeah, I think I mean, that they don't. And yeah. um, I'm just saying, and I also hope she's maybe okay. that they're yeah, <laughs> really. Rachel, <laughs> she, she are, are you okay, Rachel Maddow? Yeah. We know I you're saw listening. Her on, We're worried uh, about it. the Colbert. <laughs> Uh, late night show mm -hmm. this week, and she's in a cast, so I don't think she <laughs> I think she's actually in pain. Oh, um, <laughs> like, like in, in a cast, arm cast? cast? No, it's you're a like, foot cast. She's talking oh, about oh. crutches. Because oh, I was oh, like, wow. yeah, she was just cast in. So yeah. first of all, Ruby <laughs> Rose it. is playing Batwoman, which sounds very cool, um, and she's playing yeah. Vesper Fairchild. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I saw the trailer for that show, and it was, yeah. <laughs> was it, was it okay. amazing? Uh, no. no, it just looked very, like, extremely overacty. It looked great, like cinematography. I was like, "Wow, this looks really cool," and the costume looks great. And well, it's the CW, it, not HBO. Yeah, yeah. It's just I don't know. Yeah, it was just like, can we do some other takes on these lines? <laughs> but yeah. well, it kind of goes back to like the thing about like these Marvel movies, and it's the sheer like sort of aggregate weight of them. 
Yeah. It's yeah. like every once in a while, something like just the pressure of all the weight of the sheer amount of content kind of mm-hmm. makes you feel like something is going to come out of like something that will come out of it. It's just what. Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, it's funny because I, I can't remember if it was Tom Holland or somebody I saw some interview with, you know, talking about being in those movies as an actor and talking about I don't, I don't remember if it might have been one of the Star Wars movies. I don't remember. But some actor was talking about, you know, they had this scene and it's green screen and there were practical effects and all these things. And they were like, y- you have this feeling of I'm going to do a take and that's going to cost like a million dollars. right? <laughs> and then if that's not a good take, I have just wasted a million dollars <laughs> like and like That's you know crazy. and like it's just such a strange thing and then sometimes you know I, this has to be the case and i think the actor kind of talks about this but mm-hmm. it was like you know if you don't find it you're done yeah mm-hmm. and like it is, move what on. it is it's time to move on and it, because we don't have the budget to do that again and it's th- like it's so different from that versus have you guys seen the square i don't know mm-hmm. no uh, wait is, uh it's it's all it's takes place in this art museum yes and well, yeah and that final scene with the with there's a guy who's like acting like an, an ape that movie was so good it's so fucking amazing but what's really i mean the movie is just brilliant and has some of my favorite scenes ever but um there's this the, my one of my favorite scenes is where there's just this art gallery you know a section of the museum and these people just poke their heads in and then poke their heads back out and don't <laughs> actually go in and look at the art. And I was just like, oh, God, that was so good. It's like a three-second scene. But I was just like, ah, that could be the whole movie. I'd be so happy. But, like, listening to, I was, I remember, if I, I think I was reading an interview with the director, and apparently, you know, they were asking him, well, what scene was the longest? And he said, oh, it's the bodega scene with the woman who, I think the guy offers her a sandwich or something. Mm-hmm. Totally innocuous scene. Super short. Mm-hmm. Apparently, they spent the whole day on that scene, wow. and they did something like 50 takes. Oh, my God. And, but that's his style, is that he workshops, and you should incorporate this immediately into Mother Come Home. <laughs> um, no, but they work. He Apparently, it'll be like, okay, we're going to do this scene, and they'll do it and do it and do it and do it over and over and over again. And then, like, and like it'll be getting to the end of the day. That's all they've done is that scene. And then he will start like acting like this crazed coach and be like, we've only got five more left. Okay. And like getting everybody pumped. And he's like, and he said in the movie, and you watch the movie and it's like, th- I mean, the acting's amazing yeah, and, and totally unnerving in many spots. But you know, he said that most of the takes, I think it was like, you know, the second to last or whatever right. people's yeah. energy would just be like, okay, all right, we're going to power through this. But uh-huh. this very collective, like very actor driven, very story driven kind of approach. And it's like, you can't do that. Yeah, you know, <laughs> right. And uh, we just got right back yeah. to the Marvel. Question. Yeah. yeah well, know. it's because it's like the the thing about like feeling like you can't fail because it's going to cost a million dollars. Yeah. Like you have to be able to fail in order 100%. to yeah in order to achieve some. You know, like mm-hmm. the 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 thing about like getting people to give their best ideas is that you have to like give them permission to also give their worst ideas. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. it's just about like being able to be honest about like. You know, and sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. But if mm. you start saying, like, I can't say this thing because people are, I'm going to be, you know, ridiculed because this is, this might be a bad idea. Might not work. Mm, then right. that's 50% of your ideas. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you're just kind of stuck with the ones that are the most middle of the road. Yeah. And yeah. you can kind of see that in the way that the Marvel movies are yeah. executed. Yeah, they yeah. all, f- there's, there's not really any nuance. It's just kind of, and now I land this mark and, you know, and moving on to the next thing. Yeah. You know? And you have to, and that's what I'm saying. I feel like, I think the actors do a great job of that, but you know, yeah, that's just it. It is what it is. Like that's, yeah. you know, they can't explore <laughs> very much because well, they don't have time. It's like the movie version of a musical, you know, yeah, yeah. It's mm-hmm. very digestible and mm-hmm. just leaving. So, so I uh, found something interesting on a website called Caffeine Informer. Okay. Um, which is a very interesting website where you can look up the caffeine content of like anything that has caffeine in it. All and right. here's the fact that blew my mind. Okay. So I had heard that, you know, a average human person should not have more than 500 milligrams of caffeine in a day, Okay. which sounds like a lot of caffeine. Half a gram of caffeine, 
lot of caffeine. Um, and turns out, like a Starbucks venti, like twenty ounce coffee, okay, four hundred milligrams of caffeine, which is the same as five Red Bulls, or oh, like wow. eight really? cans of Coke. Yeah. Wow. So ca- yeah. so coffee wow. is like has the most caffeine in it and cold brew is even higher caffeinated and i think it's the same as like two and a half shots of espresso something like that um mm-hmm. cold brew is the most because it spends most time with the coffee but watch yourselves <laughs> that's all i'm saying so like, is <laughs> now is this a venti like pure coffee like not like uh mixed with something or it's just right, like yeah 100% it's just black coffee just yeah they're like okay. regular huh. like dark roast coffee yeah, yeah, yeah. like yeah whatever like see i totally subvert that by drinking coffee flavored milk there which you is go basically what my coffee is <laughs> yeah. my wife my wife dr- drank one of my coffees at one point she was like god it tastes like sugared pizza or yeah. something. Like, <laughs> disgusting <laughs> like i'm like but that's what i like i only started drinking coffee maybe like five years ago so gotcha. that's yeah. amazing yeah. to me yeah because i drink about a quart of coffee a d- like i've <laughs> right? shown yeah. up to jobs and i have a quart jar, um, qu- mason jar, quart size mason jar. Our, listen- our, our listeners can't see this, but Jen yeah. actually has a milk jug of coffee yeah, that she's, she's just been, pounding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's got well, I mean, I have to say, jar, like, right? everyone <laughs> at this table is drinking coffee. We are. Right. Clifton, when he told us that fact about coffee, had, like, crazy <laughs> coffee eyes. You know, I'm, I've been, I'm into caffeine, and I just realized but that, that is amazing. Isn't really? that crazy? Like, yeah. I thought that, like, the energy drinks, or it's like two and a half monsters or something like that. Wow. You know, I thought these those drinks mm. were, like, way more caffeinated, and, like, Viso is this sure. local um, energy drink company, and they put 250 milligrams in one of their drinks, which I was like, oh, that's so a lot. So two of those, and those are will, done. Yeah, yeah. They, they say not to drink more than two in a day, and honestly, like, I'll drink half of one and be like, Bleh. I think there's, I mean, there's, like, yeah. B vitamins and, like, you know, guarana or whatever, those other things in and there. Cocaine. And cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> and a little bit Obviously, of cocaine. Yeah, but, a um, yeah, <laughs> so it was just interesting to learn that, yeah, you actually max out your quote unquote like daily limit after you know the equivalent of like two normal yeah. sized cups of coffee wow. so all right just keep it in mind I will, i'm definitely going to i heard that oh, uh man. was it blonde coffee it yeah has the most caffeine i think that's yeah. i think they were yeah. the one they were the yeah. lighter the roast that one. The, yeah. the more oh, caffeine oh interesting i yeah. think oh really the light roasts yeah. have See, more coffee than oh because they don't burn it off coffee. when they darken Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I usually that's drink the light roast. Okay. Yeah, see, now well, you know what's going on. Chatter, chatter. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, see, it's not as it's not as much milk as you thought it was. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm enlightened. Yeah, great. Let's uh, do some plugs. So okay, this is a uh, you can plug anything, um, anything that's going on in town or theater, in your life. music, television. Uh, I'm gonna plug Jen. Everybody, check out anything Jen does for the rest of her life. Hey, great. I like that. I got lifelong plug. <laughs> Boom. I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to plug Paul and anything. <laughs> well, I mean it, it is true like I'm finding stuff of yours all the time that like I mean I I would I I'm going to plug books in general. Yes. Books and theater. There you I, go. Like there you go. in general, I would say like even I, like bad theater is worth is so much better than an okay movie. Hmm. Just in terms of, you know, th- a way to spend your time mm-hmm. and money. Yeah. So theater, live theater, and books. Great, any great. Any all. I just want to shout out the amazing uh technical team on Mother Come Home. Uh James Mates, the technical director and uh and video designer. Um Alan Klein, the video engineer, Rory Brashears, uh the sound designer, um Mark Greenberg, the composer. Uh, Molly Gardner, who is the associate technical director, um, and yeah, that's the team, and they're they're amazing. Um, I mean, the the amount of work they've done and the amount of artistry that they've brought to the project has just kind of made it like it it, it couldn't happen without them. So they're I have to give them a shout out. Love um, it. I think that's great. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't have anything active to plug. Everything I'm Working on is, uh, yeah, sort Top of... Top secret. Yeah. yeah, it's either stuff that's in development or things I can't really talk about. I did have a, a series for Netflix that I art-directed that oh, uh, cool. came out in July uh, called 12 Forever. It's a kids' show, like kind of middle school-ish mm-hmm. uh, show um, that, yeah, I'm, I'm 
amazing art team, and I think we did a lot of uh, great stuff. The writing was great. Um, so, yeah, people, if they feel like watching something on Netflix, it's, uh, you know, gotten good reviews from people. So, yeah. yeah there you go. Yeah. Cool. There's a show. Great. Um, oh, I'm really stoked to see the Bacchae at um, Shaking the Tree. They just opened, like, or they yeah. yeah, opened last night. And they're running through November 2nd. Um, and I'm really excited to see that. Uh, the director, Sam, is really great. And a lot of friends are in it that are really great performers. So um, really stoked to see that. And also, I've been plugging this every show for the last month. Uh, I'm in a play right now called Complex at Theater Vertigo. Uh, runs at 7.30 p.m. Thursday through Sunday. And uh, we're running through the 26th. Uh, spooky and funny and bloody so come check it out <laughs> great season appropriate yeah um i want to i'll plug forlorn funnies sure football. definitely yeah. um let's also you know make sure you come see mother come home which yes. opens tonight <laughs> october 5th and um we run for two weeks and um let's just see oh Go see the Joker. It opens this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of, <laughs> you know, speaking of Marvel, on topic or no, DC. I'm guess. excited for that. Joaquin Phoenix looks like he's going to do a great job in that movie. Yeah, I. Uh, but then also go see uh, King of Comedy by Martin Scorsese because I'm guessing that's probably why he mm. was being asked about that in the first <laughs> yeah. place. Because I'm like, they just made a superhero film that's clearly a huge nod to King of. Com- Have you guys seen King of Comedy? No. It's well, the crazy thing is, it's Robert De Niro playing this com- failed sort of failed comedian, wannabe comedian. Oh, when did that come out? Uh, well, a like seventy, ago. probably late seventies oh, or wow. something like that. I don't know. I'm probably getting the year wrong, but uh, I feel like every film I watch is like between 71 and 78 or something that's a good era uh it is just ridiculous everybody was just bringing their a-game but uh but what's crazy about joker is robert de niro's in it Mm -hmm. sort of playing it looks like to me the jerry lewis character from king of comedy Hmm. king of comedy is one of my favorite scorsese films everybody should watch it it's and it's very the way that they sort of segue from sort of hallucination daydream to reality and king of comedy is huge influence on me i rip it off all the time so that's funny that you say that because i was like oh man this joker movie looks really good i just wish it wasn't you know a superhero movie (laughs) yeah i mean and apparently they already made this movie i'm I'm telling you when i saw (laughs) it it, i was like but i was like it was funny because i was watching the start of the trailer and i was like oh this totally reminds me of king of comedy and then Robert De Niro came into the trailer, and I was like, "Wait, what the fuck? They're remaking <laughs> like, it? it? it They're remaking everything right now." So uh, it's <laughs> yeah. Wow. Anyway, check yeah. it out. Cool, great. There's my plug. Thank you guys so much for coming on the show and talking to us about Mother Come Home and everything else. Um, I'm so happy to sit down with you guys and have this time. It was fun. Well, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Radical Listening. If you have questions or would like to reach out. Feel free to reach out to our email, which is radicallisteningpodcast at gmail.com, or visit the Coho Theater website for more information. And thanks for listening.